get into it really quickly here with what I think really matters in a 40 vote fleet. We're expecting to have about 40 votes Saturday and Sunday. So one of our big things is, is if you think about punching out and getting up into the top five, two critical things you probably need to execute is starting at the favored end to clean clear air and then getting to the first shift. So if you, if you think about it, executing that really comes down to you doing kind of some legwork before the race begins. In order to figure out the shifts, you have to sail up wind, whether you use your compass or land sites out here in the lake. You kind of want to observe your biggest lifts on port and starboard and figure out exactly what it looks like. So when you're checking the line or you're coming off the starting line, you know immediately if you're headed or lifted. And obviously if you're headed, you're probably looking to tack out and, and head out to the other side of the course. So it's very important before the start to, to really make good observations on the water where you're really trying to figure that out. So when we sail out, I'm always paying attention to my, my pointing angles. And here in the lake, we're going to get a lot of winders and shifts, a lot of isolated stuff. So you really want to try to get a, a good understanding of what's going on ahead of time. The other thing is once we get out to the start, the race committee is, is going to set a, a course. And on the lake here, because it is so shifty, the ends might be favored or not favored at five minutes, the boat end might be favored, and then at the gut, the pin is favored. We see that all the time here. So you really have to be on your toes leading into the sequence and as the sequence counts down to exactly what's going on with those phases and shifts on the water. A lot of times we end up positioning ourselves more toward the middle of the start, around in here, and really at two minutes then make a decision on which end we want to commit to based on what we're seeing up with. So at two minutes, I'm standing up in the boat, looking up wind, kind of trying to figure out what's going on with the incoming pressure and which, which side's lifted at the gun. Um, the other thing we consistently do is check the favored ends, and you can do it in one of three ways. A lot of people put their boat head to wind, and they look at the beam of the boat to try to figure out which end is favored. If you're more on a right phase, your bow is going to be more aimed toward the boat end. And if you're more on a left phase, your, your bow is going to be aimed more toward the pin. We find that on the lake here, this is actually somewhat of a lazy bad habit because there's so much differences in the wind on the water that you probably want to manually check the start versus just trust that um, style of checking the line. Obviously, if you're out in the bay and you've got maybe five degree shifts, that's a pretty accurate way about checking the start. But out here, I would, I would be a little more thorough in checking the line where I'd actually sail around the boat end on starboard and then come back and sail around the pin on port and then use a judgment based on how far you are from one to the other to determine which is more upwind. Um, so we, we kind of do that and the best way to obviously do is if you have a buddy that will sail from the pin end as you're sailing from the boat, you can get a, an exact measurement of which end is favored. We've seen in previous regattas, because of the phase shifts, literally you can gain 50, 100 yards at the start if you're in the right spot when the gun goes off at the favorite end. So immediately you can put yourself right up in the top fleet if you're on top of doing this. Same thing with the shifts. Obviously once the gun goes off, one end might be favored, but we've seen a lot out here, the other side of the course might end up being favored. So you've got to determine which is the lift from there, and hopefully you guys are, are looking at those shifts ahead of the race, and then you can spot them and then head the right way. Um, so we're really focused on that. If you think about it, a majority of your results are determined in the first half of the first beat. Okay? If you're usually punched up into the top five, top ten in the first half of the race, you're going to probably have a good score. Vice versa, if you had a bad start going the wrong way, Usually if you're in the bottom part of the fleet, you'll finish in the bottom part of the fleet. So we're always in the mindset that you want to win the race from the beginning. You really want to be aggressive toward your strategy. You want to figure out the answers and then execute on the line. And, and one of the big things we do is every race we separate. We don't look at race number two when we're executing race number one. We really put our, our mindset in, you've got to do the little things that go on before the start to be successful. And it's easy between race number two and three late on Saturday to get a little lazy and say, oh, I don't really need to check the line. 
usually what happens is there you've got your bad score. So um, we say you want to keep your mind fresh in between every race. Forget what you did last race and then focus on what you need to do to be successful in the next race and really take it one race at a time. We think that's a very good mentality to kind of approach a regatta where since in the Scott you don't have drops, every race matters, you're gonna, you're gonna eat every score you get if there are no drops. So you really don't wanna make big mistakes and if you look at your overall results, especially on Sunday after the regatta, go back and look at your best and worst scores and talk to your team about what you did right on your best scores and also kind of what mistakes you made on the worst scores. A lot of times you're going to learn a lot more doing that than just kind of forgetting about it and going on and, and, and going on to the next regatta. Um, when you're reaching up and down the starting line, what are you looking at to tell um, you we about don't, shift? We don't reach up and down the starting line. You don't? No. We normally <coughs> say, we we normally we'll, we'll stop the boat because we don't want to be really focused on the traffic because you know as you're going up and down the line, you're looking at port the starter boats and avoiding and and that type of thing. We don't really actually back win the jib, and even in the sequence at three and four minutes, we're gonna position ourselves again kind of toward the middle, and what we're focusing on is upwind and not the other boat. So we, we tend to park. And what are you looking for? Um, pressure on the water, what your relative angles are. So if I sheet in and I feel really lifted, I'm gonna to start to look toward the left side of the course because that lift will tend to phase back up the beat. So what we're looking for is that hint do I see pressure out on that left, upper left side, and is it coming down? Because that's going to be, if you think about it, you're lifted on the starter, as you get to that pressure, it's probably going to be your header, and then you pack the report. So we're, we're doing a lot of that type of mind cycles where that's what our focus is on, because based on what we see upwind there, then we're going to determine where we want to start on the line. So, so if you think about it, we're trying to execute favorite end, first shift. Very basic. Good question. How soon do you like to get out there before the start? <laughs> <laughs> if you know your bay really well, <laughs> um, typically you, you, you probably need about a half an hour to really check the wind. I think if you get out too early, a lot of times, have you ever gone out, checked everything, and then you've got a half an hour, so you kind of just sit around? We think that that's bad. If you find yourself sitting around for a long period of time, you probably went out a little bit too early. But if you find that you don't have enough information, to make good decisions, you probably went out. But that's also a preference. I mean, yeah. some individuals take a little bit longer to, to kind of adjust to the conditions. It's a, really, it's a matter of decision. We, we kind of, uh, the philosophy last one's out, first one's in. So I know that's a crazy way of thinking, but in the end, if we can conserve energy not going out early, to me, that's always something. As a crew, because we're hiking, we're doing a, using a lot of energy. If we get out there early, well, we're going to use all our energy in the first 30 minutes of the day, and unfortunately, that's not what we want to use our energy for. We want to use it at the start, first leg, and be ready to focus. So that's kind of our, our mindset. But others may think very differently, like they really <coughs> check out the shifts, get kind of acclimation. So it's really entirely up to you, like how prepared you want to get before the I, I would say it like this. If you're new to this type of um, data gathering before the start, I think it pays to go out a little bit earlier because you're not necessarily used to what you're looking for. Um, we've done it so much. It's As we're tuning our rig on the way out, we're also paying attention to the shifts and that type of thing. So we're multitasking and we can come to the answer probably in 15 to 20 minutes versus like maybe 30 to 45 minutes. So my recommendation would be, if you're new at this, to kind of spend more time on it. You, you said uh, earlier that uh, you don't sail up and down the line, that you kind of hold the place. Mm -hmm. What are the other boats doing in, while you're doing it? Are they typically also trying to hold the place? Uh, no, there, a lot of times we see people just reach up and down the line. And um, I, I think it's just different than, I mean, what we do, is we're, we're trying to pay attention to what's going now, on. There are some things that you can gain from up and down the line. You know, like he was saying, you can tell the favorite end. You can kind of do that with going up and down the line based on where the main is trimmed. So if you're on board and the main is further on the end, then you would assume starboard tack has the flavor tack. So there are some things that you can do going back and forth on the line, but it's not going to be that we can do 
So I'll, I'll draw something up and this may help. Is regardless of where you want to start on the line, let's say I really want to be up at the boat, but because there's a lot of traffic, I want to be down the line a little right there at the X. Um, if you think about it, you have a starboard lay line coming in and a port lay line coming in. A lot of times our approach to that point, we're going to have to judge our lay line. So let's say in a minute, we're probably sailing over here and then packing in on starboard to make that approach so we hit that point on the line. Does that make a lot of sense? So if we're not parked, if we were sailing up and down the line, a lot of times you're not in a good rules position because of lured boats and, and other boats to really control where you want to be. So we use our lay line a lot to get right where we want to be. So a lot of times we actually be three, four, five full lengths off the start. And then as we start to make our final approach to where we want to be, we'll harden up, come in, tack, and then try to control that. Does that help? And we'll sit there for a minute. I mean, we don't try to say, come, make 30 seconds and then be there at 15 and ready to go. We'll, we'll try to sit there for a minute and pull the boat on the line and protect our position from weather and move. And it's a little bit of an advanced feature, of course, holding the boat in one position, but the great thing is something that you can easily practice once you learn the position you learn the position. And then down toward the pin, let's say our, our start position was here, we're probably going to come in on board and then tack the lure to somebody in order to hit that position. But still, it's the same concept. We're using our lay lines to judge exactly how we want to make our final approach there to start. We're very disciplined in not chasing pressure with headers and things like that. You want to, you really want to stay on the lifts. And if you need to make a little hitch maybe to get into the pressure, that's okay. But you really want to minimize the time you're spending on the headers. That is the killer. Now, hold on, Brad, like Eustace, that may not be the case here. <laughs> no, but like, we're saying in general. So in general, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Most things oscillate, but it seems like you're within five buildings there, and you can be within 20 degrees as far as how you're getting up. So, you know, take that with a grain of salt. So, out here, I tend to pay attention more for the angle that you're sailing than the pressure. And if we do need to make a little hitch up to get into the pressure, we might do so. But yeah, we, we definitely, know, knowing lake sailing, you take a header out, you're going to take a header back. Speed recalls, if you want to speak to that. Sure. So in, in the guides, we um, go into how your tensions. So you've got your state tensions that you set up by default when you're on land. And typically most people that are running snug jib are somewhere between 90 and 120 pounds on the, the four stick. But out on the water, another great control feature is your halyard. If you think about it, if you tighten the halyard, it acts like a cutting hand. It moves the draft forward and it actually shuts the leech down a little bit on the jib. Same thing with the main. If you crank your halyard up all the way, it's moving the draft forward a little bit and it's tightening your leech. If you think about it in light air, if you're having problems with um, getting your upper back and tail tail to work, a lot of times a good remedy for that is to drop your halyard and click your tube and allow the leech to kind of spill off and open up, especially if you're stalled in, in like under three knots. So we're always looking at the amount of wrinkles up the mast and up the jib. And the way we set it is we actually sail downwind on a very broad reach and we set the luff. So you barely see crow's feet coming off the hanks on the jib. And on the main, typically you're seeing, I know it's a little different with the north, but we want to see kind of horizontal wrinkles from the boom up to about maybe just above the first bat. You don't want to be too much higher than that. If you're seeing wrinkles all the way up to the upper bat, you're probably a little too loose. And if you're seeing no wrinkles at all, you're probably too tight. So we judge our higher tensions when we sail downwind very specifically, and then when we go upwind, you're actually going to see a few more wrinkles. So it's okay to see a few wrinkles in the jib in the main. Um, as the breeze picks up, we tend to um, get rid of those wrinkles altogether. So we go up clicks and up clicks. Mm -hmm. And if we think the jib's a little too saggy in the front, and you've got too many wrinkles, just one click on the dial. And we're constantly doing that between races. So if your pressure's up between race one and race two, don't be afraid to change your, your, your halyard tension. And also, conditions change within a race. We have maybe change that within the race to be cautious of how the conditions are and where your sails are set up. Yep. And, and each boat 
you've got your own feel for how you like to sail. Some people like sailing with tighter leeches, other people like a little more twist in their leech. So depending on your style of sailing, take that into account as well. But we, we tend to not focus on that. When we're sailing the boat upwind, we're looking at the jib, making sure that the upper telltale in the jib is flowing and that we're not pinching the boat too much or footing the boat too much. So if we're in a, a time and period where we're pressured up, we're gonna sail the boat just slightly above, locking the jib telltales in so we'll feather ever so slightly. And then if we start to hit our lull, we'll cycle back to locking the jib telltales in and really driving the boat. Um, and you're also moving your weight in and out a lot. So again, if you're pressured up, you're gonna hike it out and you don't want the boat to heal up much past seven, 10 degrees. But in the light air, you also don't wanna, if you hit a lull, you don't wanna let the boat over flat because it will slow down as well. So you kind of want to move in right as you're losing that pressure. And that's important. And we'll talk about that from a cruise perspective. Um, really, the cruise is a big part of that, moving in and out. Um, some of us sometimes don't make that adjustment when the breeze gets a little lighter. We really have to maintain that angle of the boat because if we make it too flat, unfortunately, it slows down. So we really, as a crew, want to be in and out, focused on the heel of the boat and, and work with the skipper to, to keep you going. So two tendencies will occur. For those without inclinometers, most of us don't have seat angle, the actual side of the boat angle, uh, seven degrees is about parallel. Uh, judgment wise, I've never looked, I just look at, you know the, the bulkhead where the mast is, we're kind of looking at that. And, and it's a lot of feel, like if, if you feel that the blade's really engaged and you've got great pressure, you can, you can be pretty aggressive pointing the boat. You can even let the first, call it three inches of the jib even bubble a little bit if you've got the pressure. But if you go to that mode and then suddenly the boat over flattens, you know you can stand. And there's a sweet spot. I and mean, really the, the way you do that is get out there and test it. Like sail the boat flat, see how the boat appears from the, the skipper's point of view, and then feel the boat up a little bit and see, feel the boat, feel that it's powered up. And yeah. you kind of feel that, that the two differences you can the race, you can kind of make that adjustment. One reason I'm bringing it up is you keep saying you know, around seven degrees, yeah. and so what does that look like relative to just the, the hull itself coming up? That's all. It's where, so the weather portion of that arch up by the mast, it's where that probably comes level. Yeah. People really being strapped in tight, and a little bit of back wind. I understand the leech tail a little bit, back wind let it off, so bounce that a little bit, but I've seen other people that sail to make the boom inside of the corner, but and they seem to go fast, but I, which, what do you prefer? I mean, what is, what's, I mean, I've seen both work. But. So you kind of have to go back to how the sail works uh, fundamentally. And if you think about it, if the entire leech is hooked, you're going to have a stall portion in the upper third part of the sail. Well, that's not going to work too well because it's actually going to reduce your hull speed. So you need to balance between, if you look at a leech of a sail and you're kind of drawing off to the side, let's say your boom's there and your main's coming down with a couple of atoms. I think you've got three or four atoms in the scum. You need flow in the upper portion of the sail. That's why they put the telltale up there. So if you, it's okay to let it stall very slightly if you've really got good pressure in, in, in boat speed. But if you don't have good pressure in the boat speed, you have to open up the upper portion of the leech. So we sail in both modes. Like some of the time when we're driving and trying to build pressure, I've got to be very conscious of having flow in the upper portion of the main. So I'm looking up there constantly if I feel like I'm not fully pressured up. But when I have really good pressure and I go into that point mode, um, basically I don't really pay too much attention and I'm feeling the main. So I want to squeeze the main and try to get as much height out of the boat as I can. So it's a feel thing. And then if I feel like I suddenly lose that pressure, I'm going to do a check down, a visual check down on my main leech to make sure I, I've got flow. Um, and it's easy to make a mistake there where you over trim it and that'll actually cause you to stall. Or under trim it. If we under trim yeah. it, we're going to lose pointing in this boat. Yeah, you want to make sure that you're not flowing 100% of the time. Either. If, if you feel like you have pressure, are, are you worried about maybe sort of that upper tail tail and the leech is screaming? I mean, in, in a lot of boats that I would sail, sometimes I'm not having that upper 
be screaming if I feel like I got some pressure, but if I, like you say, if, it's, if I don't have pressure, I want to open it up and get it going, or you always have that leak, that tail No, some of the times we, we shut it down. Um, <coughs> if you look at percentage, you'd say 20, 20% you want to shut down? Yeah. And that would be when? Um, when you're fully hiked out, the boat feels great, and you're really trying to point the boat. But if, it's, if, if, if you're not fully hyped out, if it's 10 or less, you, you always have that tail fail screen. Yeah, if I'm in a build pressure situation, I want to maximize the flow in the upper portion of both the main and the jib leeches. And, and to do that, you really have to lock in your telltale so they're both dead streaming back. And then both the crew and the skipper want to look at their leeches and make sure that you have the right amount of twist. You're not worried about the fat and uh, no. up there. No. Okay. Another time, sweep up. How, how often are you cleaning the main, or are you playing it 100%? The, the only time I've ever cleaned the main is on a jive down. And if you think about it in the Scott, we don't really have spreaders and side stays or, or back stays like that. So your main controls on your main leech are your vang and your, your main sheet. And so if you think about it, the vang is really there to control twist when you start easing the main outside. So if you're all the way trimmed in, your main sheet is basically controlling the amount of twist in the leech. And so in lighter air, it's the main sheet that matters. But once you start getting into breeze, let's say you don't put the bang on at all, but you're dumping the main, that upper leech is going to twist <coughs> too much. So you have to start adding bang once you start easing the main sheet in order to control the twist and say. Mm -hmm. so, so if you think about it, the bang becomes very important once you start getting into an overpowered situation and are dumping your main. We actually take the slack out of our bang, so when we start to ease, we're maintaining our leech twist. And then from there, once we start to ease out, you know how you've got the three kind of grip stripes in the back? As you start to get out to this, um, the corner, and then the strip one in from the corner, that's where I'm constantly looking up to at that to make sure that I'm not stalled if we hit a wall, or if we hit a pump, I'm putting the appropriate amount of bang on to control where I want that leech. So we're, we're constantly paying attention to the leech upwind. Um, I think that's probably something that most crews and skippers don't do enough of. And when you switch modes in the boat when flying the Scott, it's crucial that you kind of pay attention to that as you shift gears. And that really helps you keep the boat going. If you think about it, you hit a lull, you don't ease the bang off, but you start to drive the boat a little more, mainly just still stalled, you're going to slow down. So you've got to pay attention to that in order to keep the boat moving as well as shift the way you're driving the boat. Sandy Douglas designed the boat. He always used to say, sail the boat flat. And I think he was referring to a higher wind speeds, like over 10, to sail it as flat as possible. But on lower wind speeds, we found that healing the boat helps you drive the boat up. So what is your opinion on actually making the boat heal in lower winds. If, if you think about it, you're really trying to balance the helm. So as you heal more, it increases your weather helm. You're fighting the rudder more. Well, if you're fighting the rudder too much, you're slowing the boat down because you're turning the rudder aside and using the water as you're going to the boat. You want a little bit of weather helm because without it, the boat's going to tend to want to float. So there's a fine line there between pointing the boat really well and having too much helm. Um, and that, a lot of that's controlled by not only the rig setup, but the heel that you sail with that. So, fundamentals, the more you heal the boat, the more helm you're going to build, the more it's going to want to head up. And you feel that on the water, so if you're fighting the rudder too much, you're probably sailing with too much heel. And in lighter wind, you want to generate that helm to try to point the boat.